everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I want to have a slightly circuitous discussion-ish about a topic I've seen come up a lot lately on TikTok, a bit on Reddit, and of course it's come up on YouTube, and it's kind of a topic I've talked about before, but there was something in the last week that zinged in my brain like, oh, this is really just a framing thing, and I thought it might be illuminating to share some of my framework for how I think about making money in publishing. The disconnect I'm talking about is, you know, I've gotten a lot of questions. It's not uncommon, like, when we talk about traditional publishing versus indie or traditional publishing in general, but when this is asked, it's almost always in a versus situation of like, yeah, well, but the royalty rates are so low. Like, is it really worth it to you that you're only getting 10% and what about writing full time? And like, what about like the money making aspect of publishing? And where I think the disconnect is, is that for a lot of traditionally published authors, no, I mean, not all, obviously not all, but certainly not for me and not for a lot of the people that I know, partly because of the reality of making money off writing, period, making money off of creative endeavors, how difficult it is to support yourself, and just the long game strategy of a publishing career, that stuff doesn't enter into our minds, not at the front of our minds. I don't even really think about in any real way or care about royalty percentages in publishing because it just doesn't matter because of the way that money and sales and long game career strategy works in traditional publishing. So I said this would be circuitous for a reason because this is a weird topic to kind of talk around and it's very much about kind of sharing my own personal perspective and processing some of my own thoughts on this. And I'm honestly genuinely fascinated how different human beings have different thought processes. And it really wasn't until someone asked this question in a very specific way on TikTok that it clicked for me of like, oh, we're literally looking at this topic completely differently. And that's not shade or casting aspersions. I actually totally get the other mindset just had it occurred to me for quite some time because of how I see and approach publishing. I think what we see so often in a lot of approaches to being a writer, to a publishing career, is the money aspect, is what do you have to do? How many books do you have to publish? What is the strategy? How do you establish yourself to make enough money so that you can support yourself? This makes total sense to me in indie, especially because it's incredibly possible in indie in a very specific way, especially in particular genres, to go for the strategy and to make it work for you. Many people do. That doesn't mean it's not possible in traditional publishing. It is. There are people who end up making a lot of money in traditional publishing and are able to make that equation and math work for them. Though, asterisk, I've talked about this before and I just this will always say it again and remind people, a lot of the authors, whether they're trad or indie, who are able to make this equation work are not the sole source of income in whatever their family structure is. You cannot ignore the silent partners who are very often part of this equation, who have their own income sources, many of whom have traditional full-time jobs, who come with the healthcare benefits, who are doing their retirement investment savings. It's really important not to forget that. And I personally am always going to be approaching this as a single person who comes from a lower middle class background. So I have a far more scrappier mentality of like, I need to figure out how to support myself. And it causes me such stress and anxiety. The idea of inconsistent income, not having health insurance, etc. So that's always going to inform my personal mindset. Meaning I am someone who went right into the workforce after college, I mean a few years after college because I graduated into a recession, trying to find steady income, a way to support myself. So that's always going to color my personal mentality as well as my goals and long-term strategies. But back to the disconnect and kind of front of mind goals. I think very, very often in the indie versus trad mindset, in people who choose indie for themselves, though I think there are people who choose trad who think it's going to be, who have this front of mind and may end up being disappointed. I just think it's, it's different priorities. You have like a tier list of things that are going to be important to you in terms of publishing and goals for your career. 
and I want to find a way to do this so that it generates enough income so it is an income generator to support myself is often more aligned with the indie publishing mindset. So when I get that kind of question, it's like it kind of smacks across my face and hits a brick wall because I I don't think in those terms because you have to take into account how traditional publishing works. Here's here's the thing, by the way, I I both want to compliment indie and what it can do for many people, but I don't want to give a false impression. It's not an either or. It's not like go to indie if you definitely want to be able to make a ton of money to support yourself. Ask any indie author. Indie publishing is hard and some people are way more successful than others. You still have to have like certain things that align for it to work for you. And I also think, you know, we're still in the proof of concept stage in a lot of cases to see what the long, what it is long term for a lot of people. Meaning, are we going to have authors? There will always be some, of course, but is there, are there going to be a lot of authors who can do this for 20 to 30 years. Asterisk, there are a ton of authors who can't do this for 20 to 30 years in trad either. I think generally, no matter what your publishing path is, there are a lot of ups and downs, things that are unknowns in publishing, trends and shifts and diminishing returns and like you could break at any moment or you could wash out at any moment. And you know, you could, it could be great for five years but then it's not great in 10 years. I think that those variables, those frustrating <laughs> variables exist no matter what. That is just a reality of a creative pursuit. It sucks to be a creative person who hopes to earn a living off of their creative work. Some areas of creative work are more lucrative and stable than others, and novel writing generally isn't. And that's the thing, novel writing generally isn't. There are a lot of variables at play and it is definitely, it's a long game. And particularly in traditional publishing because a huge part of it is you ceding control of a lot of things in exchange for something. You're ceding control to a traditional publisher who of course you hope knows what they're doing so that the offset would be well getting paid in advance. You cannot forget the advanced system of traditional publishing. It shifts the mindset hugely because it's not like, oh, 10% royalties because 10% royalties only matter if you earn out. Most books don't earn out, you get your advance. So it's really more like, well, how much is my advance and playing the game of how much, can, you wanna get as much as you can out of a publisher. We wanna be paid for our work and you want to have as few payments as possible because payment schedules factor into this. And, but you want it to be offset where it's like, you're not gonna utterly fail if you don't sell enough copies so that you can get another contract. And it's this delicate dance, but meaning we're thinking about advances, not so much royalties. When you are with a traditional publisher paying sufficient advances, you care a lot more about the royalty percentage if you're going for a smaller publisher. And yeah, if you are going to a traditional publisher who's no advance or low advance, yeah, you should be trying to negotiate for a higher royalty percentage because royalties matter more in terms of like, cause you'll hit the point where you actually will earn royalties sooner or faster if you sell X number of copies, if you have low or no advance. It's complicated. But yeah, seeding control to hopefully get something back. And part of what you can potentially get back from that bargain that you strike with traditional publishing, if that is the path that you're going for, if you're fortunate enough to get onto the path, if it's what you want and things go decently well, it's they're incurring all of the costs to establish you as an author, as someone readers, as a brand, as a person that readers can go to for X kind of book. So hopefully, you know, they like you and front list sells back list and meaning it's, it's cumulative. It's the first book leading to the second book leading to the third book. I recently made a video about sales and I said, you know, you're not just one book because it's true. Of course, this long game strategy, also a thing in indie. Really, no matter what your publishing path is, you should be thinking strategically, like it's not just the first book, it's the next book and the next book and the next book. Indie has different variables and rules and like it, it can be more of a volume game, not always, but in trad, it's less of the volume thing, but it is definitely cumulative and long term. So the reason for me at least that it's like 
I went blah when someone's like, yeah, but what about you get such lower royalties? Like, how do you live off of that? You don't. <laughs> that That's not... That, it just doesn't occur to me as a writer with a day job who is aware I don't expect my writing to fully support me. And yeah, if you go into trad pub with a short term goal of no, I really need this to support me and support my family, it can work out. I have seen people knock it out of the park and they do get large enough advances and sales and it it all works out. But so often I've also seen the opposite happen and I'm a more cautious person and a lot of my friends align with that as well. You end up being friends with people who have very similar mentalities to you. And so it's really more about like, okay, I've got, this is me personally, I've got a fourth book coming out. I'm seeing a positive sales trend. Now that I've switched to thrillers, each subsequent book we hope sells a little bit more. When the new ones come out, we hope it sells more of the old ones. We've got multiple formats. We've got, I've got like all these like pokers in the fire, sold a fifth book, writing that now. And it's, it's steady and it's building. So long term, it might enter my mind of like, okay, how do I make this work to support myself off of my writing? Long term, it's the 10% royalty rate thing, but only if you earn out. But here's the thing, if you're paid decent advances and you do manage to earn out, which often will mean you're, you've sold quite a bit of copies, hopefully if that happens, it's because you've broken out. And 10% of a lot? is still a lot. 10% of a little is obviously not a lot, but because the whole advance thing, if you have a decent advance, so, mm, you, you, you kind of get what I'm trying to say. You aren't gonna nickel dime that it's only 10%, though if you sell enough copies, there's often an escalator, it'll increase to 12%. On hardcover, paperback percentages are lower, ebook percentages are higher, but you're inevitably going to sell fewer ebooks, especially at full price because Trad Pub doesn't do the say pricing model is indie, so complicated. By the time you're getting that 10 or 12%, in many cases it is so many copies that you're not fussing over the only of it because you seeded, you seeded that control, you made that bargain, and it pays dividends because publishing did its job, Trad Pub did its job, and in return, look at all this money that you're getting. Like some of the big authors you can think of, and this is why we all wanna be those big authors, asterisk, therefore it is kind of true that for mid-listers it kind of sucks the most, but then like I said, you try to get the highest advance you can relative to the number of sales that won't mean you're a failure because you keep every single cent of your advance and like decent but not astronomical advances can be nice and can definitely add up. But those best sellers, I've seen some of the royalty statements for those bestsellers. And by the way, I didn't see those royalty statements through like special magic I possess. I saw them as part of a public lawsuit and those royalty statements were exhibits. And like, look, you you know logically, th like you have like a, a feeling that certain authors are making bank. Then you see the royalty statements and you know that what's on that royalty statement is only 10 or 12% of the profits. And that's when you really understand how much money publishers make off of best-selling authors and how those best-selling authors truly fund <laughs> the rest of us. Their profits pay our advances and many, many other things. It is illuminating when you realize what 10% of millions is. 10% of millions is a lot of money. <laughs> And you're thinking, well, if you were self-publishing, you could have you could have more of that. But the chicken and egg always is going to be with a breakout hit in traditional publishing. Would that author and book have ever gotten there without traditional publishing? And in a lot of cases with the distribution network and like machine that you get in TradPub, in a lot of cases, the answer is no. This is also why for select indie published titles, when they are unicorns and they do break out, it can behoove them to then sign contracts with traditional publishers in some cases because the degree to which then a large traditional publisher with their machine and their mechanisms can further break out a title, it's just money. It's money. It's money. Money is great. <laughs> and so I personally think of it in those longer terms. A 
course the reality is you can't guarantee that you're ever going to reach that point but that is the aim and the goal and ultimately that is kind of the aim and the goal no matter what kind of side you fall on to my mind it's just long-term versus short-term goals if supporting yourself in the short term and going full time as soon as possible, like really generating that income is more of a concern and you want the control to try to hopefully make that happen. And especially if a genre is really huge in indie, yeah, I totally see that making sense. But it can also work as a long term goal and either side is definitely taking a risk because it can just as easily not happen for someone as it can happen for someone. And so that's why I'm like, oh, in terms of pros and cons, it's really just about framing and context and what is the, the your priority goal tier list for your career and what career success means to you. And this ends up being really funny timing because this morning Kate Cavanaugh posted a video which was a response to a video Cam Wolf posted a few months ago talking about kind of what career success means like is wanting it enough the answer is no wanting it is definitely not enough there's a lot of like work and variables out of your control that go into it but I was like oh I was just about to sit down and talk about this and the adjacent side of this topic because a lot of the stuff Kate talked about was you know for a lot of people the goal and what makes you a successful author, a successful writer, a successful career is being able to support yourself off your writing. And I know that that is the metric that a lot of people use. And I thought it was so interesting that Kate has been kind of reframing that expectation for herself. And so maybe it's just a matter of when you do do that reframing, depending on how things go for you, the kind of what you write and the pros and cons of the different paths and the the gamble that you want to take no matter what choice you make you're you're basically taking a gamble for how to achieve your either short-term or long-term goals i actually think it's kind of damaging if that is your primary metric and i know that it is a primary metric for a lot of people but meaning it's becoming increasingly more and more difficult for writers to earn a full-time living off of their writing this has been the case for decades Cost of living is increasing, everything is more and more expensive, and sadly people value writing and the creative arts less and less over time. We've always had issues with them valuing it, but we're definitely seeing diminishing returns. Some of this is actually that it's easier than ever to be a writer and to publish your work and for things to be accessible, the idea of being a writer to be accessible, which is a good thing. But with that democratization of writing, which is due in large part to the internet, there's more information and more encouragement and more avenues for writing. But the flip of that is supply and demand. A lot of people won't pay for writing at all. They think they shouldn't have to pay for something that they want to read. They think everything should be free. We are not going to talk about piracy in this video, but just saying, it is increasingly more and more difficult to earn a living off of your writing. It's very much the have and have nots. It's like the one person, it's, it's just like society. It's like the 1% versus everyone else. Meaning it's this widening chasm between huge best-selling authors who are able to make it happen and they just sell incredible volume and they see more money than you can ever fathom and the rest of us. And most of us fall into the rest of us, like literally no matter what your path is. Like we all know that there are self-publishing unicorns who make bank and there are unicorns in trad pub who make bank. But for most of us, it's going to be a lot harder and it's going to be more of a struggle. And I do think it is important, generally speaking, it'll make all of us feel better <laughs> about ourselves if you realign your metric of what it means to be a successful author. Because I, I bias, I obviously don't think it means you have to be earning a full-time income off your writing. I don't think I don't count as a professional writer simply because I have a day job and publish on the side. I mean, it's a real book. It's a book. I wrote it. It's published. You can buy it. Like, this, this counts. Is it technically a side hustle? Yes. Though the thing is, the bonus income that I get from publishing, because I consider it bonus income because I have my day job, it's nothing to sneeze at. It's like a decent amount of money. And if I lived in a different place, maybe I could support myself off my writing and you go, well, then why wouldn't you move somewhere so that you can live off of your writing money? We're not going, this isn't therapy. We're not going to go into all of my personal hangups and anxiety about money. 
I did a little bit at the beginning, but I just thought this would be a fun little discussion of kind of just the different frameworks for how you approach writing and your career and goals and tears and I find it really really fascinating and maybe this gives you a bit more of a picture into how I personally approach writing and money and traditional publishing. I will tell you, small update because I have talked about this topic before. This is We're considering this the 2022 update on the do I want to be a full-time writer. We all have an if then benchmark for if I get this I will quit my job and do this full time. I finally know what my if then is, like my realistic if then. Because I'm now five years into my career, I'm five books deep, like five out or contracted, and I'm finally able to think about mid-career. I'm officially mid-career, like mid-ish career. You're basically, once you get past like three or four books, you're mid-career until your late stage career and if you're late stage career you're lucky. And I've learned a lot over the years and you have conversations with people and I love being candid about money privately. I'm definitely one of those token millennials who believes we should share what our salaries are and be transparent with each other and I don't like the whole like corporate capitalist bullshit of you shouldn't talk about your salary. I, I hate that. It's how they dick you over. And I feel the same way in publishing and so privately I am always forthcoming with people. I will talk about my advances, I will tell people what I make from my YouTube channel and the only reason I don't do it publicly is that the system around me tells me I shouldn't. <laughs> but you talk to other people and you get a sense of what's possible. Obviously my if then would be if I become a breakup bestseller. Duh. Like real breakup bestseller. I'm not talking like listing for a week though I would love to have it. Hi New York Times, please love me. Like it, listing for one week isn't enough sadly and you're like really and it's like yes. <laughs> it has it's it has to be a lot of sales. A lot of sales. Obviously earning out would be great. I've talked to friends who work in television production, television writing, and I've talked to people who have had their work optioned and turned into TV shows and movies. That's my if then. I've told my boss, I said, if the Ivies becomes a TV show or Pretty Dead Queens or The Bitter End, whatever, I'm quitting my job. That's it. That's my if then. Because you don't want to know the bonkers amounts of money you get if that happens. It's a lot of money. At least it's a lot of money to me. Uh, it's certainly enough money to live off of for several years. And I wouldn't look that gift horse in the mouth, especially because if you do reach that stage, and I just want to tell you, it's very rare to reach that stage. This is still a pie in the sky if then, but I have an if then. There tends to be a positive feedback cycle if you get a movie or a TV show, almost regardless of whether it's good, almost, with book sales. They exponentially, they feed each other. <laughs> That's why it's my if then. Because if I did have something turned into a TV show, I would ask to be in the room. And if I'm in the room, then that becomes my job. And I definitely wouldn't be able to juggle my full-time job and that. But if that happened, pie in the sky, I would definitely make enough money, more money than I make at my day job. So that's my journey. <laughs> Five years for me to have an if then that is in no way going to happen anytime soon. But for me, that is progress. It's truly a very long game of could this ever be something that I do full time and that supports me full time. And I still really won't care much about the royalties, honestly, the royalty percentage, because yeah, if I, if I can earn out and get to any area of exponential growth, 10% of a lot is still a lot. And you just have to hope that it's 10% of a lot. I hope this has made sense. I was really working out my own thought process about this once I had the aha moment of like literally it's just reframing. It's framing of how how you're approaching this and like tier goals. Let me know down below in the comments what you think. I mean this is a fascinating one because it is so personal. Every person is going to come at this from a different mindset with different variables because it yeah it's down to your background and your mindset. The situation in your life like I would probably have a very different feeling about this and like set of goal priorities if I were partnered with someone who was drawing a like a really steady six figure income with a health plan. Or if I weren't American. <laughs> oh, oh, that's just sad. <laughs> I don't, mm, that's just sad. 
I'm also, of course, very fortunate to have my day job. I work for a really great company and it's pretty stable and I feel very, very fortunate in that regard. Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I mean, all I do now are basically like thinky, weird, discussion-y type videos when I feel the mood, so I'm gonna keep it coming. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and happy writing.